We go all in on the opening ceremony because of the respect we have for the players who are about to play. They deserve the world's greatest opening act. And we're always trying to exceed expectations with that. This is the year that Arcane is revealed to players around the world, sharing a much deeper realization and expression of the world of Runeterra. We had to find a way to draw inspiration from Arcane and tell the main heartbeat of the show without giving away anything that might be considered a spoiler. From the get-go, we had planned on a kind of half-and-half half hybrid ceremony, creating these immersive, stunning music videos, but then also to have live show elements. We wanted to create something that was less in a virtual space and more in like a physically-based space. We wanted to build Piltover and Zahn on stage. We were really excited by the idea of being able to bring magic elements into the real world. This is going to be the biggest live event Riot's ever done. That was the initial plan before everything changed. It's no wonder that Forti spent the last three or four years working on Arcane. It's very well done. The art for it is beautiful. That's exciting for us. On the other hand, we have to make sure that what we do is able to live up to that as well. Arcane is going to invite players around the world to better understand the characters of League of Legends. So we felt the creative opportunity was to bring the worlds of League of Legends to life in the context of the opening ceremony. For two or three months, we had been planning the opening ceremony as a stage show. The show was completely planned around this massive set that's going to be built inside a stadium, a stadium that's bigger than Bird's Nest, so scale was going to be a big component. This was going to be the biggest venue that we've ever played in, and we were putting in a lot of detail and energy to making sure that we could do something very magical in front of this enormous crowd. We were to do three different music video segments that would then play a part in the live show, appearing on the monitors, interplaying with the live event. And I remember looking over their decks and I was like, this is very scaled. The challenging thing was working with the live show and what their needs were for their story beats. We have to get from A to B, but what's the coolest way to get there? It was ambitious, it was enormous. It had automation, it had lots of things, all designed down to the nut and bolt. We're 10 months into planning. We are thousands of people hours into creative. We've now been in technical and physical production for about seven weeks. We're putting gear on boats, we're putting gear on planes, we're signing contracts. We're in a place to really start to bring this show to life. It's extremely difficult to get everything aligned while we're in a global pandemic. About a month before Worlds started, we just started to realize we weren't able to pull off Worlds at the scale we knew we needed to pull it off. Without certain resources and without certain individuals, it becomes impossible under those constraints to achieve what we set out to do. Nick, I think, shielded us from everything until he was certain. On August 16th, it became clear that the opening ceremony was not going to be possible to deliver in mainland China. On August 19th, I knew with certainty that Worlds was going to be leaving mainland China. The opening ceremony as we understand it doesn't make sense outside of one of the biggest stadiums in the world, which meant we now had two different emergency searches to launch. It's super hard to make that decision, but the most important thing always has to be the competitive integrity of the competition, our ability to deliver a Worlds that is worthy of our pros and our fans around the world. And so everything comes to a complete standstill. Hitting the brakes like that is jarring, to say the least. It was an entire reframing of thinking, what could this even be anymore? So we all just like go cram into a room and say, we're not coming out until we know what this is gonna be. We went through every version of this show that we could. I think in the back of our minds, all of us knew like, this just has to become a full cinematic, full VFX, full animation. And I think we were on our first day of actually live shooting. They pulled me aside and they were like, look, we're no longer doing the live show. We want to go even crazier with it. We made the choice to keep the music videos as a static element of the creative and then started writing a new narrative. 
And that's when concepting around what we've begun calling the show open began. As we made this shift to cinematic, we penciled Reykjavik Iceland as where the world championship was going to move to. In parallel, we'd identified the United Kingdom as the right place to move the opening ceremony to. While we were confident that we had great footage from the music videos we'd shot in Los Angeles, the show was still missing this massive sense of spectacle and splendor. It became increasingly clear that this cinematic moment should be this massive marketplace in Zon where everyone can feel the richness of the world. This thing had so many moving parts from the music video production teams here in LA, the performance stage in Iceland, the whole build that needed to go into that, the set build in Birmingham, which was where the Zon set was built. You know, these 30 foot high walls that we've built, you're wrapped 360 in Zon. It is very rare to be able to play in a playground like the set they created in Birmingham. There's all the many animation and VFX teams we had to bring on. We needed to aggressively and massively scale our entire team. We started up an effects department, an environments department, lighting departments, character animation. All told, over 1,300 people were required. In a normal world, like you would have seven or eight months to produce this thing, we had less than two. The only way to pull off a project of this scope in a timeline this short is to have highly functioning partners who can just do what they do so well. This entire 13 and a half minute piece is a Jenga tower, you know? If, if one moment of it doesn't land, the rest of it's at risk. It was so important to have people already looking to the post and VFX on set to make sure we were preparing ourselves and setting ourselves up for success. So in wrapping up in Birmingham, what will happen across the next two and a half weeks is an extraordinarily aggressive post-production schedule. We have to move that process as fast as it can physically go. The greatest constraint on this entire project is the ability to do animation, set extension, and visual effects at effectively feature film levels of quality in 10% of the time frame. So we needed to bring all of the weird elements together, 3D, 2D, live action, uh, set build, set extensions in 3D, but also we want it to look like the Arcane series. So like it's all these departments moving forward in parallel. We're trying to make them all feel cohesive and similar, which is very difficult when nobody has anything finished along the way. We had to do a lot of things in tandem where usually we would wait for one step to resolve before we moved on to the next step. By the nature of the sort of production timeline that we had, we knew that we were not gonna be uploading the show till probably a few hours before it went to air. Everything is down to the wire and we are going to be using every second until that final delivery to get things as polished as, as they need to be. A week out from the show, none of us are sleeping well. This is the five day period where everything has to converge. We still didn't have much finalized because everything was still in flight. I think the first sequence that we had done was between Playground and Enemy when we see Jinx and Vi in the arcade. And that was the Wednesday before it aired on Saturday. For as much time and attention went into bringing Zon and Piltover to life, the thing that we could never lose sight of is how important the reveal of the Summoner's Cup and the players is to the overall moment. So the way we revealed the trophy this year, we were excited by because this intricately designed Hextech Sphere served a narrative purpose in, in sort of the story we were telling, but also became the thing that uh, unveiled the trophy. It re-centers us back in the purpose of the moment, which is the World Finals. The night before the show is sort of this twilight of stress. You're close enough to delivery that you can't change the outcome, but because you haven't actually made it across the finish line yet, there's this incredible pressure that you might not. At this point, we're gonna do whatever it takes to make sure this thing goes off without a hitch. We knew we weren't going to have the show open completely delivered until about two hours before broadcast. Ultimately, we're going to come down to the mercy of how fast can a file be downloaded. Friday evening, 
I was waiting for my last deliverable. Three of the deliverables had come through via Dropbox, but the two largest ones hadn't yet. By this time, we absolutely have to be uploading the files, otherwise it's not gonna make it. What if the fiber goes down? What if the power goes out? Someone was running over to the colorist uh, in Burbank to get everything on a drive, place the final shot in, upload it, press play. I think four or 5 a.m. by the time we're like, okay, everything's like out of our hands at this point. We took our hands off the wheel and popped open a bottle of champagne. <laughs> After that moment where we hit play, kind of a blur. It's the first time everyone can take a breath. I just remember this great sense of um, accomplishment and, and joy, being able to see it all together with the people that helped you build the thing. After that, it was like, well, what do we do now? <laughs> the thing that I think will separate this year is the level of passion that everyone brought to the project. And I think that that shines through in the finished product. Just being able to, to work and occupy in the same space as so many creative people, a, a dedicated group of fans and players all together in this great community, it feels really like an honor to be part of something like this. When we affect people emotionally or when we impact people, with what we do, that's that's what I'm most proud of. I think with every opening ceremony or show open, we push the boundaries a little bit more in different directions. So who knows what we'll do next? <laughs>